Nightbeat starts right now. We begin with the live look outside. Clear skies here in San Antonio, but a very different story on the coast where Hurricane Hannah touched down earlier this evening. Yeah, Katie Blake has been tracking the storm all day long. She joins us now live with an update. Katie? Yes, good evening. We are still keeping a close eye on Hurricane Hannah. It barreled into the South Texas coastline earlier today, still producing a lot of rain and even some severe weather in portions of deep South Texas. It is the eye wall here that you can see was very well defined, very symmetrical at the time of landfall, now starting to maybe become a bit smaller, a bit less organized, but Hannah still packing a punch tonight. At the time of landfall, 5 p.m. on Padre Island, Hannah was a very strong category one hurricane. It wasn't too far away from becoming a category two storm, but formally Hannah will go in the books as a high end category one hurricane winds 90 miles per hour pressure 973. That makes Hannah the strongest landfalling Texas hurricane in July since Claudette back in 2003. Claudette's pressure at landfall was 979. Hannah's was just a bit lower, and that does make her the uh, strongest landfalling July Texas hurricane since Claudette back in 03. As of the 10 p.m. update, Hannah still at category one status. Winds though are down to 75 miles per hour. Pressure is up a bit, so Hannah is beginning to weaken, but it is still going to be a long night for our friends down in deep South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. We're going to dig into this forecast a little bit more and also let you know what your Sunday has in store here in San Antonio. All of that coming up in just a bit. Tim. Thanks, Katie. We'll have more on Hurricane Hannah. Meanwhile, our other big story today, a man is dead and two others are severely burned after a plane crashed on the south side this morning. It happened around 9 o'clock near the Stinson Municipal Airport. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with the couple who stepped in to help the victims. And we must warn you, some of the details you are about to hear may be disturbing to some. We come up on this big guy and he's like, I'm burning, right? So we stopped. And um, there's another gentleman sitting down and you can see this guy's like fingers like and he's his whole face is red. It was a traumatic scene Veronica Salas and Michael Ordiales were not expecting to roll up on during their morning bicycle ride. The couple said a fire in the distance caught their attention and when they got to the location they found two severely burned victims. And the guy's like just give me some water so I got my water bottle and I'm squeezing as much water and I'm telling everybody else who's standing like get water, please. The Federal Aviation Administration and police said a single engine plane attempted to take off from the San Antonio Stinson field, but soon crash landed behind a home. Without hesitation, Ordiales ran to the backyard where the mangled plane landed after learning another man was still inside. I finally see him and it's like he's like laying on his back. They say the extreme heat coming from the fire prevented them from removing the man's body. It was a terrible situation that like come up on when you finally realized that he was, you know, he was gone. I was like, oh, yeah, like it was too, I was just too late to help him. He was somebody's dad, somebody's husband. He was somebody, you know, and I just hope that as bad as it was and as bad as he died, that his soul is somewhere, you know, good because it was what I saw wasn't good. The couple said many people had stopped and watched what was going on before first responders got there. They hope their actions encourage others to step in and help, no matter how helpless the situation may be. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. The two men who survived that crash were taken to Bamsey for their injuries. As of right now, there is no cause for the crash. The FAA and NTSB are assisting in the investigation. Turning now to coronavirus coverage, nine more people have died of COVID-19 in Bear County, bringing our death toll to 322. In addition, 758 tested positive today. That brings the total to 35,690. Some good news, though. Today marks the sixth consecutive day. Hospitalizations have been on the decline. Right now, there are 1,047 patients hospitalized locally. 419 of those people are in intensive care. That's down by 11 from yesterday. Meanwhile, more than 21,000 people have recovered. An outbreak of COVID-19 at the Children's Shelter has led to new precautions. A shelter spokeswoman confirms four staff members and 11 children have tested positive for the virus. This comes after public health officials began to see an increase in pediatric cases. The night team, Stephen Cavazos, with the new measures now in place. In San Antonio, COVID-19 now reaching children in the foster care system. Anais Bieta Miracle is a chief public relations officer at the Children's Shelter off Woodlawn, where the virus made its way in. 
prior to the surge in cases, nothing like this had happened. The outbreak started on July 15th when two children began to experience a fever. After receiving positive results, cases in the shelter began to increase. So far, 11 out of the 39 children have tested positive, along with four staff members. Pieta Miracle says it's possible a staff member contracted the virus, which led to the spread. The shelter has been in constant contact with Metro Health officials since. We need to be able to ensure that we are providing and working hand in hand with our public health experts to mitigate the transmission. And that means retesting once a week for children and staff who have negative results. The shelter also has a nurse on staff and temperatures are checked twice a day. Staff is also being required to wear PPE. Meanwhile, children who test positive are isolated away from others and staff members are asked to stay home if they begin to experience symptoms. And while there are about 2,000 children in the foster care system around Bear County, the children's shelter has stopped taking in new intakes, at least until the outbreak is under control. We can make sure that those children who do come in don't get the virus. We want to make sure that they're safe. Yet a miracle says she's grateful no child has required hospitalization and most are doing well, but she urges the community to take public health seriously. We're we're not immune. No one is immune to this virus. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. COVID-19 cases continuing to soar nationwide, prompting health experts to urge for stricter restrictions. 16 states now breaking records for hospitalizations and nine states are reporting record deaths this week. Meanwhile, Florida overtakes New York in total statewide cases, now second only to California. Dr. Deborah Burks, a member of the White House Coronav Coronavirus Task Force, points to evidence showing bars and nightclubs could be the source of the increase in recent cases. It is something about drinking, not wearing a mask, and being close to people, particularly indoors, that is actively spreading this virus. Massachusetts is one of nine states seeing a drop in COVID hospitalizations. Next month, the state will start mandating anyone coming in from hotspots to quarantine for two weeks. Still to come on the night beat several days of celebrations in honor of Congressman John Lewis kicked off today in Alabama. We'll take a look at how the civil rights icon is being remembered. Plus, Regis Philbin dies at age 88. A look back at the Live with Regis and Kelly host historic TV career and the legacy he leaves behind. Tomorrow marks 30 years since Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. The act requires communities across the U.S. to accommodate their disabled neighbors. In San Antonio, we have an entire department devoted to ADA compliance. 30 years of history and work. They didn't really think that a person with a disability could or would lead a full life if they had access and opportunities. Um, but that changed with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it allowed people with disabilities to be seen and it brought in the new era of opportunity and independence. The city of San Antonio's Accessibility Compliance Department's sole responsibility, ensuring people with disabilities live in the most accessible and inclusive community possible. They've been at it since the 70s, adding wheelchair ramps to buildings, helping local businesses better serve people with disabilities, and making sure an American Sign Language interpreter is present during press conferences. I feel like some days we're a jack of all trades, um, but we really, we really value that partnership with our community and whether it's an internal city community of our city staff and, and our department or that relationship that we have with, with uh, the community members. In addition to working with community members and city departments, they also work with the Bear County Office of Emergency Management on their Accessible Alert program. Which is an all accessible uh, communication alert system where they provide emergency alerts in American Sign Language and are compatible with Braille readers. Now, as the organization celebrates 30 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act, they stress that even though they've come a long way, there's still a lot more work to be done. As the city has grown and as the ADA has come into being, we have programs and we have audible pedestrian signals that we didn't used to have. We have accessible playgrounds and play equipment that we didn't used to have. Um, and we keep on going. 
If you have questions about how to receive services, you can call their office directly at 210-207-0713. You can also just always call the city's general help number 311. Tomorrow on the ADA's actual anniversary, I speak with advocates and a dedicated, wonderful family about living with disabilities here in San Antonio amid a pandemic. Back to our big weather story today, Hurricane Hannah. Uh, taking a look now at some video that we showed earlier. This was taken by Justin Horn and our KSAT Storm Chaser as they went down there. This is in the Corpus Christi area, which took some of the brunt of Hannah as that storm made landfall around 5 o'clock this afternoon. The first one uh, to hit Texas this year so far. Uh, we do know, Katie, that uh, Bob Hall Pier, the end of that pier, mm -hmm. uh, was ripped off by uh, the winds and the waves that were battering that area. Yeah, Hannah is a very good example of there's no such thing as just a category one hurricane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they can be dis destructive as well, and there's going to be probably a lot to clean up down in deep south Texas and along the coast over the next couple of days, but they've got a rough go of it tonight. Heavy rain still falling. Flash flood warnings are really popping up down there, and we could see some really high rainfall amounts uh, through the overnight hours down in parts of the Rio Grande Valley in deep south Texas. Latest stats on Hannah still a category one, but now a much weaker category one hurricane than when it made landfall. You'll remember maximum sustained winds at landfall today were 90 miles per hour. Now we're down to 75 miles per hour. So now that the eye of that storm is not over water anymore. It is starting to weaken and that trend will continue through the overnight and tomorrow. Hannah expected to weaken into a tropical storm as early as tomorrow morning and then really fall apart over the higher terrain of Mexico tomorrow afternoon and into Monday. Until we get there, though, some big time rain on the way tonight. This is estimated rainfall through Monday evening across portions of South Texas. Uh, some spots could see more than 10 inches of rain and there were already some spots down near where Hannah made landfall that are seeing rainfall totals like that tonight farther north closer to us here in San Antonio through Monday evening. Unfortunately, uh, we well, we don't want 10 plus inches of rain, but we will be lucky to see maybe one inch of rain from some passing showers through the end of the day on Monday. But weather still very active down in deep south Texas just because we're past landfall doesn't mean that Hannah is uh, really letting up tonight and things are going to be rough down to the south. So we've got a few things to look at here. Uh, and I really kind of want to get into this. So, of course, there's the the eye of Hannah. They're still quite large, but starting to shrink just a little bit as this system weakens. All these flashing green boxes, those are flash flood warnings uh, down near Port Mansfield, where Hannah made landfall all the way down to Brownsville, and then some flash flood warnings popping up as far north as Corpus Christi. National Weather Service estimates that down near Port Mansfield, where we do have some of these flash flood warnings, anywhere from 8 to 10 inches of rain has already fallen, and these heavy rain bands that are setting up over these places that have already seen several inches of rain today. That's going to lead to more flash flooding overnight tonight. We've also got some heavier rain bands that will be working inland tonight as well. Corpus looks like they've got some flash flood warnings in and around their area. But one thing I want to focus on here and if you're if you'll think back to some tropical systems when we're covering these, sometimes we talk about the potential for the outer bands to produce tornadoes. The little cells in those outer bands really like to show rotation. Typically, uh, it's very short lived as far as any rotation in these cells, but they can prop tornado warnings, um, and that's what we're seeing tonight down in a portion of Live Oak County. This is going to be until 1045. So we've got 35 right here. Uh, George West, I believe, is off to the north there. Uh, our places are not showing up very well, but this is B County here in Beeville. So then this is Live Oak County right here and then over to McMullen County. So I'm going to keep an eye on this little cell that is tornado worn right now. It looks like it is uh, to the south of George West there, and this would be moving off to the west. So I'll keep an eye on that for you. Live Oak and McMullen counties, but this again, just another kind of facet of these tropical systems. There's a lot going on here. There's the heavy rain, storm surge and wind, but then you've also got to consider that in some of these outer bands, you can get some tornadic activity at times. So we're going to pop that away. See if that'll go away for me. There it goes. Um, as far as our forecast here in San Antonio, uh, we're rain free at this time, but we've got some showers off to the east that will try to swing our direction. And we're hopeful that tomorrow we'll have a better chance at some passing showers thanks to the outer bands of Hannah that will kind of swing our way. And I think future cast paints this pretty well. Heavier rain still down to the south tomorrow, but those outer bands could toss us some scattered showers, maybe a rumble of thunder through the day tomorrow. We get into Monday and activity starts to become a bit more diurnal in nature. That 
means it's going to be dependent on the heat of the day, but we'll keep lingering rain chances through the middle of the week. Temperatures now, most of us in the mid to upper 70s still have a little bit of a breeze, not quite as gusty as it was earlier today, but you may notice a bit of a breeze overnight tonight. 76 your low temperature, 20% chance of a spotty shower, but I think late morning, early afternoon tomorrow, we'll have a better chance to see some of those scattered showers from Hannah's outer bands move in for your Sunday. Low in rain chances through the middle of the week, and before you know it, it will be hot again, so we'll take highs in the upper 80s, low 90s while we can get them. And coming up next half hour, we'll keep a close eye on radar, and Hannah will have more updates, guys. All right, thank you so much, Katie. Good to see even just some percentage in our forecast. Yeah. All right, the Spurs' uh, second scrimmage in Orlando so far at the attempted restart of the NBA, ending very similarly to the first scrimmage. Similarly, but I think a better overall performance, at least if you look at the final score and the offensive output. But obviously a lot to clean up when we come back. We'll talk with the team and see how they feel about their own performance, especially on the offensive side. Plus, no Jamal Adams for the Cowboys. He's officially off the market. Got the details next. Second scrimmage for the Spurs in the NBA bubble brings a matchup against the Brooklyn Nets. The big message for the Spurs after their last scrimmage, defense. And they're still having some issues with that. Second quarter, Jarrett Allen with a putback slam. Nets go up 43-41. This one, though, tied at 57 at halftime. Third quarter, Spurs trying to keep pace. DeMar DeRozan's layup here is denied by Joe Harris. Check out the replay, and Brooklyn capitalizes on the momentum shift. Garrett Temple. Takes it himself to the cup for two. Brooklyn now leads by double digits, 86-74. We head to the fourth quarter now. Keldon Johnson trying to keep the Spurs in it late. He drives baseline, fakes right, and goes glass for two. And then a little later, Johnson drives hard to the basket for the game-tying bucket. Count it and one. San Antonio keeps it close down the stretch, but the Nets get the win 124-119. to 119. Six Spurs finished in double figures, but just like last game, it's all about the learning experience. We're still trying to find our mojo a little bit. Like um, at times, it's been looking really good. At other times, we're, we're trying to do that. Uh, we're, we're turning the ball over a little bit too much. We're a little bit all over the place. But like I said, that that stuff takes time. That's what the scrimmages are for to to get better and then get used to these these new situations. We want them to be aggressive. We want them to set the tone defensively, and we want them to try to play fast, uh, you know, offensively and and, and be aggressive. San Antonio has one more scrimmage before their season officially restarts. The Knicks play the Indiana Pacers on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Lakers fans are collectively, collectively holding their breaths for Anthony Davis. The star power forward was poked in the eye while bringing in a rebound during today's scrimmage against the Magic. Davis went down to the court, was helped to the locker room, and did not return to the game. The Lakers open the season on Thursday against the Clippers at 8 p.m. In the meantime, young Pelicans phenom Zion Williamson has re-entered the NBA bubble. That's according to a team statement from New Orleans last night. Williamson left the bubble due to a private family emergency and says he's excited to get back on the court with his teammates. As per NBA policy, Zion has been tested for COVID-19 and is starting a four-day quarantine period, after which he should be available for games. But the NBA has not made an official statement about his status yet. Reports say that Tom Thibodeau is returning to the New York Knicks on a five-year deal to become the franchise's next head coach. The former Timberwolves and Bulls head coach was an assistant coach with the Knicks under Jeff Van Gundy from 1996 to 2004. Thibodeau is 11th in career winning percentages for coaches with 500 or more games under their belt. He's now tasked with rebuilding a Knicks franchise that is not currently in the NBA bubble and has missed the playoffs for the seventh straight year. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Jamal Adams is officially off the market. The Jets' safety was traded to Seattle this afternoon for a bunch of draft picks. ESPN's Adam Schefter broke the news this afternoon on Twitter. Adams has been linked to the Cowboys multiple times and even publicly states, stated his desire to play in Dallas, but no deal was ever reached. Now the two-time Pro Bowler heads to the Seahawks along with a 2022 fourth-round draft pick. New York gets a first and third-round pick next year, a first-rounder in 2022, and safety Bradley McDougal. The NFL Players Association has officially announced schedules for preseason practices and most most players won't put on full pads for the first time until August 17th. The Texans have already started camp this afternoon along with the Chiefs. They get a three-day head start on that timeline. Otherwise, the first four days of camp involve COVID-19 testing and virtually meetings. 
followed by two days of physicals, and then an eight-day excuse, excuse acclimatization period starts on August 3rd with 60 minutes of weight training and 60 minutes of conditioning. From there, it's a gradual ramp-up period right into padded practices. And you can count Alex Smith in for training camp this season. The Washington quarterback has received clearance from his surgical team to return to full football activity. Smith suffered a gruesome tibia and fibula fracture in a game against the Houston Texans back in 2018. He's currently being tested for COVID-19, but he expects to report to the team's facility on Monday Monday to undergo a team physical. Simply remarkable story. Coming up later in sports, the second day of Major League Baseball action and San Antonio FC returns home. Got the highlights for all those games. Tim, Courtney, back to you guys. We'll look forward to it, Andrew. Thank you. You got it. We'll be right back. We want to bring you some late breaking news. San Antonio police say a man is now dead after running across Loop 410 just north of Highway 90. This happened just after 9 p.m. The man was hit by several vehicles and died at the scene. Police tell us they believe the man might have been homeless. No one else was injured in the incident. Vehicles involved in that crash apparently are cooperating with police this evening. Several days of celebrations honoring the life of Congressman John Lewis beginning today in Alabama. The 80 year old civil rights icon died July 17th. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott with the details. Six days of events honoring the life of Congressman John Lewis began today near his childhood home in Troy, Alabama with a service celebrating the boy from Troy, a name given to the civil rights icon by Martin Luther King Jr. Mourners gathering at Troy University, 800 tickets given to the public, the family asking everyone attending to wear a face covering. May his willingness to cause good trouble prevent us from tolerating injustice. May his example inspire a new generation. In 1963, at the age of 23, Lewis was the youngest of the big six civil rights activists who planned the historic march on Washington. Let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. Lewis led a march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in 1965, demanding voting rights. He and several other civil rights activists were badly beaten by state troopers that day. On Sunday, a military honor guard will escort Lewis's body across the bridge for the final time. He became a figure known around the world for action on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, confronting Alabama state troopers. And now Alabama state troopers will lead his body around this state as we celebrate his life. Lewis will lie in state at the Alabama State Capitol on Sunday before traveling to Washington, D.C., where the man many refer to as the conscience of Congress will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. Wednesday, his final journey will take him back to Georgia, where he will lie in state at the Capitol before being laid to rest on Thursday. His family has asked anyone wanting to honor Lewis to share tributes online or place blue or purple ribbons on their front doors. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Selma, Alabama. Well, he spent more than 16,000 hours on TV with the career spanning more than half a century. It's why the loss of iconic TV host Regis Philbin has touched people across the nation. Philbin began working in TV following a stint in the Navy. He landed his first talk show, The Regis Philbin Show, in San Diego. And by 1985, he was in New York hosting the show he's most known for, live with Regis and Kathy Lee. In 2001, Kelly Ripa took over as the co-host and Regis remained on Live with Regis and Kelly until 2011. The veteran broadcaster also graced primetime by hosting Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? He was nominated for 37 Daytime Emmy Awards and won six of them. Philbin is survived by his wife of 50 years and three children. He was 88 years old. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has authorized a COVID-19 test which can be used on anyone, even those without symptoms. The FDA reissued an emergency use authorization for a LabCorp test after it proved it could detect the virus in asymptomatic people. Not only that, but the company can also test pooled samples of up to five swabs at a time, saving resources. The FDA says the broad screening could be a game changer in reopening schools and businesses. Right now, the test is only available through a prescription and only a LabCorp test kit or health provider can collect the samples. Emirates Airline has become the first airline to say it will cover passengers' medical expenses and quarantine costs if they contract COVID-19 during their trip. 
The airline will pay medical expenses up to $173,000 and quarantine costs of up to $160,000 or $160 rather for 14 days if the person tests positive for COVID-19 while away from home. The coverage will be available to all customers at no extra cost from now until October 31st. It's valid for 31 days from the moment they fly the first leg of their trip. So passengers can continue to benefit even if they travel onwards from their Emirates destination. Good news for the economy. The housing market came back to life in June. The National Association of Realtors says sales of previously owned homes jumped nearly 21% from May. That is the largest month over month increase since tracking began back in 1968, but sales are still below where they were before the pandemic started. NAR's chief economist says record low mortgage rates are helping buyers. The market activity has been curbed because of the low inventory at the moment. Well, social distancing has apparently made people less concerned with the way they smell. That's according to the consumer goods company Unilever, which says that there's been a drop in demand for personal care items. Brands like Dove Soap and Axe Deodorant say lockdowns have led to a big decline in sales. So what are people buying instead? Ice cream brands such as Breyers, Ben & Jerry's and Magnum saw their sales increase. They also say consumers are eating more soup and using more meal kits. In the midst of this pandemic, on top of the coronavirus, the infections, the hospitalizations and deaths, our financial and economic future remains a big question mark. Tomorrow morning on Leading SA at 8 a.m., San Antonio's Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Interim President and CEO Juan Ayala joins us live to talk about the current San Antonio economy and what's next. We want viewer input as well, so if you have any questions you'd like to ask, you can submit them right now on ksat.com in the Leading Essay section. As if the pandemic hasn't hit people hard enough, now new data from the Federal Trade Commission shows a huge spike in COVID-related ripoffs and fraud. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz on the types of tricks to watch out for to protect your good money and your name. As COVID-19 inundates hospitals and headlines, fraud is piling up too. Callie Davidson got a notification that a purchase was made at a nearby Target. The problem? I'm like, hmm. I'm not at Target. Identity theft is thriving, but way beyond credit cards. The FBI reports a spike in fake unemployment claims too. Unfortunately, scammers are very creative and they come up with all sorts of ways to prey on people in the middle of a pandemic. The Federal Trade Commission has some 59,000 complaints related to coronavirus or stimulus scams with losses of more than $74 million. So consumer beware, phony remedies. No cures or vaccines have been approved to treat COVID-19, but fraudsters are selling teas, oils, and intravenous vitamin therapies. Stimulus scams. Beware calls or emails that use the word stimulus and ask for your social security number. Shady sellers. Fake websites set up to sell high demand stuff like masks and hand sanitizer. Work from home offers. Beware paying up front for materials. Jobs should pay you. COVID contact tracing scams. They need info, but not accounts or money. And phishing scams. Be skeptical of websites that have coronavirus or COVID-19 in their domain name. People need to be very vigilant against sharing personal information if they did not initiate the contact. To protect yourself, do a simple Google search with your subject and the word complaint or scam. Bottom line, be skeptical of any email, call or text that wants something from you. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. A look outside with live cam just shy of 80 degrees. Looks like we do have a few clouds out there, but mostly clear skies and look, live cam shaking a little bit. Still a bit of a breeze after a somewhat gusty day today due to the center of Hurricane Hannah's circulation down to our south. Blink and you missed them, but we did have a few showers around San Antonio today. Only added up to a trace of rain at the airport, unfortunately, and I think that was a good rainbow picture there uh, on our time lapse. 93 the high temperature today. We've got another shot at some passing showers due to Hurricane Hannah tomorrow. We'll talk about that and get you another look at that hurricane down in South Texas coming up in a few minutes. 
Well, we didn't get a ton of rain here from, you know, the hurricane, but that wind was pretty yeah, gusty today. Yeah, a little breezy out there, a little gusty, but uh, I'd like to see some rain, but I uh, understand this is the way these things go. Yeah. We It did go a bit farther south. It was like each yeah. update from the hurricane center the past couple of days was farther and farther south. So that does take us out of the running for some good beneficial rain, unfortunately. But the hope is that tomorrow some of those outer bands, especially as the system as a whole continues to weaken and fall apart a bit, we'll get some showers from the outer bands tomorrow. We'll look at radar estimated uh, rainfall just over the past 12 hours. You can see where those bands of the hurricane set up in the eye wall and that's where you see those colors getting into the whites and the grays. That's where you start to get above 12 inches of rain and unfortunately there will likely be some uh, catastrophic flooding, especially once we can get to daylight tomorrow to get some visuals of what's going on down there in deep south Texas tonight. Rain is still ongoing. Flash flood warnings have been continuing to pop up over the past couple of hours and they'll likely be extended in into the overnight hours as Hannah continues to move inland. Still a category one hurricane uh, at this hour, but weakening in that trend will continue. It's off of the water now, so just a steady decline in strength with Hannah, but that doesn't mean that the rain stops right away. And you'll see there's the eye, but back offshore, these heavy feeder bands of rain, this bright red color indicating some really heavy rainfall that still has to move inland. And uh, these feeder bands, they, they can sometimes be tricky and they can also sometimes produce uh, tornadic cells and that's what we're seeing in a portion of Live Oak County. So a lot to kind of digest here. Hannah's going to continue to shift off to the west. There will be likely some catastrophic flooding down in deep south Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. For now, I do want to give you kind of a bigger picture look at radar. We are going to drop down into this new tornado warning that has been issued here, but there are some cells that are coming in uh, from the far outer bands of Hannah. These will continue to swing off to the west. We can see some isolated showers tonight, but we're hopeful that some of these outer bands again will will toss us some shower activity during the day tomorrow. So I do want to get into this tornado warning. We touched on this a little bit last half hour. This is the far southern tier of our viewing area here. This is Live Oak County and then McMullen County there, and we've got a tornado warning that included George West just barely. So there's three rivers. There's George West. That was that tornado warning we talked about last half hour that will go until 1045. So that's about to expire. So they've extended it uh, downstream a bit off to the west. We've got these cells here in those feeder bands. They're notorious in these tropical systems for wanting to rotate. And many times you'll see tornado warnings issued because of that. The good news is usually it's very short lived rotation. Nonetheless, we've got a sliver of uh, Live Oak County and the southern tier of McMullen County in a tornado warning. I'll find out how long this is for here for you until 1130. So we'll keep a close eye on that again. That is kind of the southernmost tier of our viewing area, but we'll keep a close eye on that for you. Southern tier of McMullen County, this tornado warning until about 1130. I've got to go get my clicker. It's over here. This two clicker thing. I'm just I'm still I'm still working out, still working out the kinks. Uh, let's take a quick look at future cast in it's doing a pretty good job, I think, of picking up on some of those bands that are still well off to our south and to our east. It does try to toss us maybe a few showers overnight. The rainfall coverage will be pretty low through the overnight hours. However, tomorrow during the day, again, some of those bands tossing us some showers. We'll have a scattering of some shower activity possible essentially through the early evening hours. Once we start to lose the heat of the day tomorrow, that rainfall coverage will start to wrap up. We get into Monday. Hannah really is no more, but there will be some lingering moisture and upper level energy kind of draped across south Texas kind of the leftovers, if you will, of Hannah, and that could result in some showers, really diurnally driven showers as we get into the early and middle part of next week. So dependent on the heat of the day tonight, 76 your low temperature, 20% chance of a shower, but a better chance, I think, late morning into early afternoon to see excuse me, a scattered shower passing through on Sunday. I did want to show you quickly what else is going on in the tropics. We've got Hannah, of course, uh, at our back door there. Gonzalo was a tropical storm. It fell apart. However, off closer to Africa, there's a disturbance that the Hurricane Center has pegged of having a high chance of becoming at least our next tropical depression in the next five days. So the tropics are heating up and, of course, we'll be here to keep you updated. In the meantime, no triple digits. That's good. Good news. Nice. <laughs> Thanks so much, Katie. Uh -huh. All right, Andrew, Major League Baseball is back, and I am happy about that. <laughs> I bet you are. The Indians didn't win today, but at least the Astros... They, they seem to be pretty doing, doing pretty well right now. When we come back, we got the highlights of how Houston performed today in their second home game, and they were hitting the ball really well today. Plus, San Antonio FC plays their first game back at home since March. Next.
Well, the Spurs offense showed up tonight, but San Antonio still dropped to 0-2 in NBA scrimmages after a 124-119 loss to the Nets. While the team is still dealing with a lack of physical interior presence without LaMarcus Aldridge and Trey Lyles, the Spurs coaching staff has started to mix and match some lineups. So what do they think of what they saw tonight? Started talking about different combinations, different lineups, and obviously we've started in our two scrimmages, DeJounte, Derek, DeMar, Lonnie, and, and Jakob. So those guys that typically maybe are usually out there with the, you know, um, specific shooter, shooter, whether it's Bryn or Marco or something like that, you know, aren't always taking on that role of the attempts. So we just want those guys to be more aggressive from the three-point line of uh, looking for those, whether they're off the catch and shoot or off the dribble. Derek White led the way with 22 points tonight, the first spur to score more than 20 points in a scrimmage so far. Great start for the Texas Rangers in the brand new ballpark, 1-0 after a 1-0 win last night. It looks like they're going to get off to a great start today. Fourth pitch of the day, Shin Su Chu puts a charge in a deep left center, but it's caught at the wall by Garrett Hampson. What a grab, robbing Chu of the first homer in the new stadium. Check out the replay here, full extension. Let's head to the fourth inning. Now Rockies take the lead here. Matt Kemp slices one down the line. This is just going to hit in fair territory. Here comes Nolan Arenado keying a two-run inning. Colorado goes up 2-0. Both teams trade RBI singles over the next four innings. Rangers down by two now, trying to mount a comeback in the bottom of the ninth. Joey Gallo squeezes a soft roller down the third baseline. Elvis Andrews scores, and it's a one-run game with one out. But they would get no closer. Texas falls 3-2. Minute Maid Park is jam-packed with people. Kind of. Astros looking for their own 2-0 start against the Mariners. Once again, the bats come alive. Bottom four, Yuli Gurriel absolutely smokes one deep to left. That is way out of here. A solo shot gives the Strohs a 2-0 lead. Same inning, more damage. Kyle Tucker drills one down the right field line. That's a fair ball. Carlos Correa rounds third, and he will score. That makes it 3-0, and they're still not done. Next batter up, Martin Maldonado hammers one off the wall and left. That'll play to a pair of runners. Astros go up 5-0. They win big 7-2. Houston has scored 15 runs in their first two games. Flying Chonkla's in action tonight, trying to hold on to first place in the South Division on the road against the Brazos Valley Bombers. Scoreless game in the bottom of the third until this. Two on for Manny Garcia, and he's going to drop a base hit into center field. Bryce Blom scores the go-ahead run, and the Bombers go up 1-0. The Chonklas let this one get out of hand in the sixth inning. They end up falling 4-0. Next up, one more crack against the Bombers to reclaim first place in the division tomorrow night at 7.05 p.m. San Antonio FC is finally back home 140 days after their last home opener. The Alamo City Club returns to Toyota Field tonight to take on RGV FC. This one's scoreless at the break. San Antonio applying pressure in the 60th minute. Christian Pirano hits Gonzalo Dorenzo in stride. And Dorenzo's shot ricochets off the goalkeeper and inside the bar. That gives SAFC a 1-0 lead. This time, San Antonio hangs on for the win. And San Antonio FC remains unbeaten in regulation with a 1-0 victory. You know, we're up 1-0 with 10 minutes to go, and, uh, you know, we learned from last week. We, we bunkered down. We, we didn't let up, and it, it was just hyper-focused the last 10, 15 minutes, and, and that was huge. That was the difference for us. Antonio wins. We like it. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. You got it. We'll be right back.